It must also be recalled that the relatively small size of Japan's naval air corps was largely a self-imposed limitation. As a nation of over 80 million people, Japan certainly had the population necessary to develop a much larger cadre of pilots had it decided to do so. The reasons Japan chose to create an artificially small group of elite pilots instead of a larger cause of aviators who were merely very good lies outside the scope of this study. So too does Japan's failure to recognise and correct its deficiencies in this area while there was still time to do so in early 1942. However, the fact that she was eventually able to find pilots, however poorly trained, for the 50,000 aircraft she would lose during the war establishes beyond doubt that the necessary manpower was available. Any assessment of the scale of Midway's human losses must also be measured against the backdrop of the grim combat in the South Pacific that unfolded beginning in August 1942. It was here, in the daily patrols, skirmishes and raids that lasted until 1944, that the cream of Japan's naval air forces would be destroyed some 2,817 naval aircraft alone between April 1942 and April 1943. Callous as it may seem, the existence or non-existence of roughly 100 carrier aircrew meant relatively little when set against this aerial meat grinder. People and planes were merely fuel for the vast furnaces of attritional combat that would soon be blazing on the southern borders of the empire. For a reader in this century, Living in a wealthy country where the loss of a single multi-million dollar fighter is front-page news, it is difficult to internalise the scale and intensity of the violence that occurred during the Second World War. Aircraft were cheap. A typical fighter cost between $50,000 and $100,000. A medium bomber, Rauchli Dabla that, they were produced in huge numbers, the United States built in excess of 36,000 combat aircraft during the war. Japan, more than 67,000. Planes were a commodity, like trucks or artillery tubes, and were treated as such. They were consumed at frightening rates. The United States lost somewhere between 9,000 and 27,000 aircraft to all causes in the Pacific theatre alone. Depending on the sources consulted, Japan lost 38,000 to 50,000 during the same period. Even accepting the more conservative figures, Japan was producing a weekly average of around 350 planes and was losing over 200 of them. Granted that in 1942 the Japanese aircraft industry was not yet producing at nearly the rate it would in 1944, but these figures make it clear that even the loss of 257 carrier planes and float planes over three days could be made good in a few weeks. Conversely, the carrier losses themselves were not made good on a one-for-one -one basis until the commissioning of Shinano on 19 November 1944, 127 weeks after the debacle of Midway, and at a point when the war was already all but lost. A corollary to the loss of these four ships was the permanent loss of tactical homogeneity in the Japanese carrier force. Uniformity of operational characteristics was a central principle that had guided the Japanese Navy's shipbuilding policies since its inception, and that had served the Navy well from Tsushima onward. The six heavy carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor composed an exceptionally well-balanced formation, the stolid warhorses of Carrier Division 1, the dashing cavaliers of Carrier Division 2 and the promising yearlings of Carrier Division 5. The pairs of ships that made up these three carrier divisions were well matched in terms of their speed, range and aircraft complements. The reason for employing ships of roughly similar capabilities is simple in the heat of battle. Compensating for ships possessing widely differing capabilities introduces an unnecessary element of complexity into an already chaotic situation. Uniformity lessens command and control friction, losing carrier division 1 and 2 permanently destroyed the admirable balance and integration that had existed in the Japanese carrier force. After the battle, Shokaku and Zuikaku were a solid core around which to rebuild, but Japan's inadequacies in shipbuilding meant that its two remaining fleet carriers would have a supporting cast of bit players, most of whom were really not up to their parts. Taiho, 
commissioned in 1944, was the only new fleet carrier Japan built during the entire war that was worthy of keeping company with Shokaku and Zuikaku. These three were the only carriers that Japan possessed during the war that were in any way comparable to the three American Yorktown-class carriers, let alone the dozen Essex-class carriers that followed them. The Unryu-class vessels, though worthy successors to Hiryu and Soryu, were not nearly as capable as their American opponents. The remainder of Japan's flight decks were conversions and misfits. So, despite being able to field nominally similar numbers of carriers in 1942 and 1944, Japan's carrier force never remotely approached the balance, cohesiveness, and striking power of Daiichi Kido Butai at the beginning of the war. Men and planes could be replaced, but the four midway carriers could not. Their loss permanently ruined what had been the most successful Japanese naval weapon system of the war, and hence must be ranked as far and away the most important material loss of the battle. A second facet of any assessment of Midway must be the strategic consequences of having lost, which requires looking beyond mere tabulation of physical losses. The material forces of the United States and Japan were not static, they were always changing in relative strength depending on a variety of other factors, geography, weather, lines of communication, and who held the strategic initiative. Thus, H. P. Wilmot noted in his analysis of the Battle of Coral Sea, that the balance sheet for the engagement had to be assessed not materially, but rather in terms of the demands made on resources by time and distance. The ability to concentrate mobile forces to dictate the direction and tempo of future operations was the all-important factor in the conduct of the Pacific War. The true cost of the battle was not to be found in calculations of ship losses, but rather in contrasting the effect of the battle on the carrier forces. This calculus applies equally well to Midway, and the true locus of that battle's downstream effects rightly lies in the waters off Guadalcanal. Japan had entered the war with the intention of eventually moving to a barrier defence backed by mobile carrier and air forces. The real litmus test of Japanese strategy was therefore to capture what was needed while preserving its strategic mass for as long as possible. As was noted earlier, the best way to preserve mass is to use it on mass instead of doling it out in penny packets. Using overwhelming force tends to keep casualties to a minimum. For the Japanese, if an objective wasn't important enough to require sending all six carriers, it wasn't worth going after at all. Japan violated this principle by initiating the action in the Coral Sea. She paid the ultimate price for her violation a month later at Midway. One immediate consequence of the calamity was that Operation FS, the occupation of Fiji and Samoa to cut off Australia from her lines of communication with the United States, was cancelled. Another consequence was the obviation of Japan's barrier strategy before it had truly begun. Without a powerful carrier striking force to transport aircraft to outposts under attack, the strategy was unworkable. This was illustrated when the Americans unexpectedly counterattacked at Guadalcanal in August 1942. The occupations of both Guadalcanal and Tulagi by the Japanese was both an extension of their defensive perimeter outward from the main Japanese base in the region, Rabaul, and an offensive move to apply pressure against Australia's supply lines. As such, Guadalcanal was essentially an outpost of Japan's defensive barrier in the southwest Pacific. Had the Japanese won the Battle of Midway, an American operation like Guadalcanal most likely could never have occurred at least not when it did. However, the victory at Midway gave the Americans rough parity in fleet carriers and enough confidence in their abilities that they were willing to fight in a remote backwater like the Solomons. Likewise, the rough parity of carrier forces of the two sides contributed to the protracted nature of the bloody struggle for the island. It is important to understand that the Japanese, while privately acknowledging the seriousness of the defeat at Midway, did not feel that they had been condemned ipso facto to fighting on unequal terms around Guadalcanal. It did not affect their strategic formulations, and it did not temper their aggressiveness. Indeed, in the short term, they were able to stay in the game in the waters off Guadalcanal. At this point in the conflict, even after the losses she had suffered, 
Japan still possessed the means to equip the air groups of several more fleet carriers, had the ships themselves been available. The truth of this statement is revealed in the prodigious scale of aerial resources the Japanese were ultimately able to commit to the Solomon's contest, as well as the fact that Japan deployed credible air groups at various points in the struggle on board Hiyo, Junyo and Zuiho. With Shokaku and Zuikaku forming the basis of their new mobile force, and the unexpected woes of the American carriers at the hands of Japanese submarines. Saratoga was torpedoed and put out of action again from September to November 1942, and Wasp was sunk by I-19 on 15 September. The odds did not turn against Japan immediately. Of the two major carrier battles fought off Guadalcanal, Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz, the Japanese lost the former but arguably won the latter. But even when they achieved what appeared to be temporary victories in the waters around Guadalcanal, they lacked the strength to capitalise on their triumphs. They could no longer close out the deal by inflicting a final, crushing defeat, driving off the American support vessels and exterminating the United States forces on the island. Had even Hiryu or Akagi survived midway, which was not inconceivable, the Japanese might have had the requisite strength to prevail four to six months later in these crucial waters. Much worse lay in store after the Imperial Navy conceded defeat at Guadalcanal. By the end of 1942, the carrier forces of both sides were exhausted and depleted, leaving the remainder of the brutal fighting in the Solomons to be conducted by surface vessels and land-based air power. The carrier fleets would not meet again in battle until 1944. But by the middle of 1943, the Americans were commissioning Essex-class fleet carriers at the rate of one every other month, a production rate that the Japanese in their wildest dreams could never equal. With nine very serviceable light carriers of the Independence class also having been commissioned in the same year, American naval aviation was now poised to transform the Pacific War. At the same time, not only had the Americans fundamentally altered the raw numbers in the fleet carrier equation, they had also radically transformed the intrinsic power of the individual flight decks themselves. The addition of a new generation of carrier aircraft, in particular the excellent F-6F Hellcat fighter, the improvement of air search and fire control radar, the maturation of the combat information centre in combination with more effective fighter vectoring techniques and the enormous increase in the number and effectiveness of shipboard anti-aircraft batteries, including those armed with radar proximity-fused ammunition, all meant that ship-for-ship -ship American carriers were now markedly superior to those of the Japanese. Almost as important was the United States Navy's development of a sophisticated mobile logistics capability, fast oilers and transports, repair ships and floating dry docks. This gave the Americans an unparalleled ability to forward deploy their fleet anchorages and then keep carriers operating in enemy waters for weeks at a time through underway replenishment. Not only was American naval aviation thus capable of threatening areas of the empire once thought to be off-limits, it could also maintain a much higher tempo of operations than the Imperial fleet could. So impressive was this cumulative leap in technology and operational technique that, in effect, the Americans emerged in late 1943 with an entirely new navy. All of these factors came together during the American invasion of the Gilbert Islands in November 1943. To support Operation Galvanic, the United States Navy employed six fleet, five light fleet and seven escort carriers. The Japanese Navy had no possibility of interdicting such a powerful armada. Several of their carrier air groups had recently been transferred to Rabaul for temporary duty in stemming the American tide, then rising in the Solomons. They had been chewed to pieces in the process, ruining the ability of their carriers to offer battle. The best the Imperial Navy could manage was sending a few cruisers and a squadron of submarines to the Gilberts. Just three months later, the Americans used a similarly enormous carrier force to crush the heretofore unassailable Japanese base at Truk. In the process, they sank nearly 1,50,000 tonnes of merchant shipping and annihilated Japanese air power on the atoll. The pattern was now set for subsequent American offensives through the Central Pacific, 
in which their powerful carrier task groups operated practically at will, bringing hundreds of aircraft to their objectives and destroying whatever naval opposition stood in their way. Here, then, is the crux of the matter as it relates to Midway and the larger strategic forces at play in the Pacific War. In an immediate sense, an American victory at Midway was vitally important in restoring the parity of forces in the Pacific, and thereby speeding up the tempo of the war, but viewed in the longer term, the battle's strategic importance is less profound. Whether or not Kido Butai had survived intact at Midway, it is clear that the very best the Japanese could have hoped for by the end of 1943 was the ability to offer battle on terms that were merely disadvantageous rather than utterly ruinous. Even had every carrier that attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941 sallied forth intact in 1943 to face the Americans off the Gilberts, the outcome there would almost certainly have been disastrous. At most, the defeat at Midway cost the Japanese approximately 18 months of strategic leverage that their four carriers might have bought them. But in the end, win or lose at Midway, the vast industrial resources of the United States gave its navy an absolutely irrevocable writ of strategic dominance in the Pacific War. This leads to the third major topic to be considered answering the hypothetical question of what it might have meant for the Japanese to win at Midway. Throughout the years, the various answers to this question seen in both books and an endless stream of internet bulletin board and listserv conversations have spanned the gamut from measured to downright hysterical. Hawaii would have been captured. The west coast of the United States would have been threatened or even invaded. Australia would have been captured. America would have abandoned the Pacific and focused on Germany. Or, alternately, America would have poured yet more resources into the Pacific at the possible expense of the European theatre of action, leaving Germany to triumph over Russia and the Allies to lose the war. Japan would have eventually been conquered by the Russians instead of the Americans. The list goes on and on. The authors, well, one of them, anyway, heartily dislike alternative history. Such exercises tend to be biased from the outset and are often used disingenuously to prove pet opinions, rather than to explore openly the downstream ramifications of a given scenario. Even used honestly, they are inherently dodgy propositions. One can think of an alternative history as being a flow of changed events radiating forward from a given point in time. The problem is, the further one goes beyond the immediate implications of the changed event, the less one can predict with accuracy what might happen. That, in turn, means that there is a time threshold before which one is at best engaged in educated speculation, but after which one is simply indulging in largely meaningless conjecture. Alternative history can't prove anything all it can do is suggest possible outcomes. Likewise, when someone says that the effects of the Americans losing at Midway were incalculable, they should be held to exactly that level of precision. The results of such a hypothetical loss, strictly speaking, are, by definition, incalculable, in that they cannot be pinned down with any exactness, pro or con. Not only that, but anyone with sufficiently deep knowledge of a given historical event can usually construct several plausible downstream scenarios from the same event that would lead to opposite ultimate outcomes. For instance, had Akagi escaped her ultimately fatal attack at 10.26am, would this have turned the tide of the battle in favour of the Japanese? Perhaps, but perhaps not. One thread of argument might suggest that with one additional flight deck and a bit of luck, the Japanese could have won the battle three carriers to two, forestalled or beaten the Americans at Guadalcanal, and thus held off defeat until 1946. Conversely, maybe Nautilus or some other United States submarine might have gotten lucky they were certainly due and sunk Nagumo's flagship sometime during the early afternoon, leading to exactly the same historical outcome. The answer is completely unknowable. Nevertheless, it is impossible to write a book on Midway and not consider some of the more prominent of these hypotheses. At the very least, the question of what would have happened to Hawaii in the event of a Japanese victory needs to be addressed, as well as the likely strategic ramifications of a Japanese victory vis-à-vis -vis the Pacific War as a whole. There's no question that the Japanese were interested in capturing Hawaii. 
John Stefan's superbly researched Hawaii Under the Rising Sun makes it clear that the Japanese were actively investigating such operations from the outset of hostilities and planning continued as late as September 1942. However, the pertinent question is not whether the intention was there. Or not, it clearly was. But whether the Japanese ever had the military means to achieve their aims. Answering this question is relatively easy. Win or lose at Midway. And the Japanese could never have taken the Hawaiian Islands under any foreseeable circumstances. The reasons are manifold and clear-cut. By April 1942, the Americans had 62,700 army troops, two full infantry divisions, plus support troops in Hawaii, and another 8,900 air personnel. The United States Army expected this total to reach at least one lakh 15,000 ground and air personnel in the near future. This figure does not include the tens of thousands of United States Navy personnel located at Pearl Harbor. Thus, even had the Japanese followed up a victory at Midway in short order with an attack on Hawaii, they would have had to contend with a Hawaiian garrison of at least one lakh to one lakh 50,000 United States servicemen. These American troops were primarily located on Oahu, which was small enough to defend in depth, but big enough to manoeuvre on, making it an enormously difficult nut to crack. The Japanese themselves thought that capturing such a stronghold would require at least three infantry divisions, or roughly 45,000 troops. This was certainly a parsimonious number of troops to commit to such an undertaking. But, even so, it represented an invasion force ten times larger than the one they had planned to employ at Midway, and three times larger than they had ever amphibiously landed at one time. It is doubtful that Japan had the sea lift capacity to contemplate such an undertaking across nearly 4,000 miles of open water in any case. Nor is it likely that even if the Japanese had been so lucky as to have captured the islands, that they would subsequently have been able to keep their troops in supply, let alone the civilian population. Even if sufficient transport could have been found, a Japanese assault force would have landed in the face of withering American fire, without much in the way of specialised equipment, and without an effective naval gunfire or air support doctrine. In the unlikely event that Japanese troops managed to gain some kind of foothold, given the size of Oahu and the depth of the American defences, there could be none of the bold flanking movements that the Imperial Army had used to such great effect in Malaya. Hawaii would most likely have to be taken frontally, considering the heavy losses the Japanese had suffered attempting a similar landing on wake at the beginning of the war, not to mention the appalling slaughter that American marines would inflict on the Japanese in similar circumstances at Guadalcanal just two months later. The conclusion seems inescapable that a Japanese landing on Oahu would have resulted in a bloodbath worthy of the Somme. Granted, the Japanese were hardly squeamish over taking such losses, but it is difficult to see how such an invasion could have succeeded. Furthermore, the Japanese would have to secure air superiority over Hawaii with carrier assets alone their land-based aircraft at Midway, over a thousand miles away, could play no real role in such an invasion. Yet, unlike the carrier task forces the Americans would go on to employ in 1944, even at the height of its powers, Kido Butai never had the ability to stand off an enemy's island bastion for weeks on end and beat it into submission. In the first place, Kido Butai couldn't bring a sufficient number of aircraft to get the job done. By April 1942, Hawaii boasted 275 combat aircraft, a figure that had increased as the battle at Midway had loomed. In the event of an American defeat there, Hawaii's air force could have been augmented still further by naval aircraft shuttled in from Saratoga or Wasp, much as the Americans went on to do at Guadalcanal. This meant that Kido Butai, even with all six carriers available, would have fought against Hawaii from a position of numerical parity at best. But more important, the logistics for a sustained Japanese carrier presence off the shores of Hawaii simply weren't there. Kido Butai could mount raids, but it could not project sustained power ashore. This meant that Japanese ground forces, even if they managed to stay ashore, would probably lack consistent air cover while trying to conduct offensive operations, not a good recipe for ultimate success.
It is true that if the Hawaiian Islands couldn't be captured, the Japanese might have tried blockading them instead, using a combination of submarines and surface forces. But Japanese doctrine looked down on commerce raiding, and as a result, their subs never proved as effective in this role as they might have been. For their part, Japanese surface forces couldn't hope to operate in the face of American land-based air power without Kido Butai to support them. Yet, the presence of Japanese carriers in the area would have necessarily been sporadic. Even in the face of a concerted blockade, it is almost impossible to imagine the Americans being willing to sacrifice the garrison and the large civilian population there. If maintaining the logistical flow to the islands necessitated sustaining Murmansk-like losses in the supply convoys, so be it. But the convoys would still have been sent. America was engaged in a total war, and failure was not an option. Just as the British had risen to the London Blitz and defended Malta in the Mediterranean, and the Russians had endured the seemingly endless siege of Leningrad, so too would the Americans have been determined to hang on to Oahu their last outpost in the Pacific. The only logical conclusion one can reach from all this is that Hawaii was largely impregnable. Its value as an American naval base might have been diminished in the short term, but the islands themselves most likely could never have been taken. The wider ramifications of a Japanese victory at Midway are less easy to gauge. It is certainly true that the American counteroffensive at Guadalcanal would never have been launched under such circumstances. Australia and New Guinea would likewise have been in greater danger as a result of America's inability to forestall continued Japanese incursions. Barring the successful occupation of Hawaii, the Japanese certainly would have moved into the South Pacific largely unimpeded, occupying the New Hebrides, Fiji, Samoa and Tonga, it is possible that they would have contemplated landings in northern Australia as well, in the short term. Then, the Allied position in this area of operations would have been made much more precarious, but it is unclear whether the Japanese really could have used the time that a victory at Midway would have purchased to good effect. No amount of territory that Japan captured in the South Pacific could solve its basic strategic problems. Taking Tonga, or even Brisbane, couldn't bring the Americans to the negotiating table. It couldn't forestall the inexorable completion of the naval forces then building in America's shipyards, nor could it help Japan build her own carriers any faster. One thing that the breathless proselytizers of Midway Doomsday scenarios always fail to note is that in all the territory Japan had added to her empire since December 1941, there was not a single production centre worthy of the name whereas the Germans had benefited significantly from capturing such complexes as the Skoda Arms Works in Czechoslovakia, the factories around Paris and in the Rhône-Alpes region, and the shipyards in Brest and Saint-Nazaire. No comparable facilities existed anywhere in Asia. Apart from Japan and the United States, there wasn't a single shipyard in the Pacific capable of launching a warship larger than a destroyer. The only decent dry dock anywhere south of Kyushu was located 2,700 miles away in Singapore. Thus, Japan's conquests contributed practically nil to her industrial capacity. Likewise, the raw materials that Japan secured in the East Indies still had to be transported home and turned into finished products. Not only that, but Japan's own industrial base had already been largely maxed out during the heated military expansions of the 1930s. In contrast to the American economy, which had been underutilised during much of the same time period and thus had plenty of unused capacity, Japan had no such headroom for significant growth. Worse still, there is credible evidence to suggest that absorbing the lower per capita gross domestic product regions like the East Indies represented a significant hindrance to efficiently mobilising the Japanese economy. Thus, both militarily and economically, Territorial indulgences like taking the Solomons or Fiji were ultimately futile, in that they extended the Japanese defensive perimeter for little real gain. There was nothing in the South Pacific worth capturing from a resource standpoint, and those garrisons would have to be manned and supplied, thereby stretching Japan's already fragile logistical resources even further. Taken as a whole, 
It is arguable that the Japanese sticking their necks out even further would merely have left them that much more exposed when the inevitable American hammer blows began in 1944. Likewise, while invading northern Australia would have been a blow to Allied fortunes, and would have potentially deprived them of a useful base in the short term. In the long term, it is difficult to see how such a move could have measurably improved Japanese fortunes. In the first place, the Australians had several superb infantry formations of their own. It is likely that they could have held their shores against the invader or at least inflicted very serious casualties on them. After all, the Australians, unlike the British in Malaya, would have been fighting for hearth and home. Second, it seems equally unlikely that the Japanese could have occupied the entire subcontinent, meaning that Sydney, Perth and probably even Brisbane couldn't have been brought effectively under Japanese control. Third, it has to be admitted that while Australia was a useful base for the Allied counter-offensive, it wasn't vital in the same way that holding Britain was for conducting operations against the continent of Europe. As the Americans were to demonstrate in 1944 in the Central Pacific, they had the means to punch directly through the heart of Japanese defences and make their way toward the home islands. Nothing that happened at Midway in 1942 could change the overall parameters of that equation come 1944. Overall, it seems clear that much of the wild speculation regarding the possible negative effects of an American loss at Midway is unwarranted. As we have seen, the American strategic position in the Pacific could be damaged, but not irretrievably so, for the simple reason that Hawaii could never have been taken away. In contrast, there's no question that in the short term such a defeat would have carried heavy penalties, particularly with regard to the South Pacific and Australia. The war might have been lengthened somewhat, but in the long term, the Americans were in a truly unique position of strength. The United States economy was already more than six times larger than that of Japan at the outbreak and would expand by 50% during the war. More important, United States industry was essentially immune to Japanese attack. The American naval building program could not be forestalled, meaning that Admirals Ernest King and Chester Nimitz knew with absolute certainty that their naval power was going to be decisively superior to that of Japan in the relatively near future. This raises the final conundrum surrounding the true meaning of winning or losing at Midway. Since the day the battle was fought, the American victory there has been labelled as being decisive. But the foregoing analysis has shown that, win or lose at Midway, it was extremely unlikely that the Americans were going to lose the war in the Pacific, and it was equally unlikely that the Japanese were going to win. How, then, can such a battle be considered decisive, as H. P. Wilmot pointed out, there is a basic contradiction in simultaneously thinking that the Americans were bound to win the war and that the Battle of Midway was decisive. To be decisive, Midway had to be a defeat from which the Japanese could not recover, of the sort, for example, that the Japanese inflicted on the Russians at Tsushima. But that was clearly not the case, Wilmot notes, given the vigorous Japanese naval actions later in 1942 around the Solomons. Midway might also be termed decisive if it had completely altered the course of the war, but that also seems untrue. If the defeat of Japan was assured because of the disparity of national resources, Midway was at best only a milestone on the road that led to defeat. It was not a signpost that marked a parting of the way one track leading to American victory and the other in precisely the opposite direction. This leads back to the logical contradiction in asserting simultaneously that Midway was a decisive battle and that American victory was inevitable, because the notion of an inevitable victory is irreconcilable with that of a decisive battle. If Midway merely hastened by some months a foregone conclusion to the conflict that still lay some years in the future, as seems to be the case, then it cannot legitimately be termed decisive. Arguing that the outcome of the war in the Pacific was inevitable is not suggesting that the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II was likewise guaranteed. Richard Overy's superb Why the Allies Won vigorously refutes the economic determinist stance regarding World War II, showing just how many critical hinge points there were in that conflict – 
His study and others render highly dubious any assertion that an Allied victory over the Axis as a whole was inevitable. This is because the real strategic locus of the war as a whole lay not in the Pacific, but rather in Europe generally, and on the steppes of Russia in particular. Victory in the European theatre was far chancier for the Allies, given the immense collective economic strength of totalitarian Germany and her satellite assemblage of allied and conquered territories. It would not be until Russia's survival was assured, in late 1942, that the war in Europe began to veer away from the brink of disaster. But paradoxically, within the more limited context of the Pacific War, it was absolutely certain that the Allies, chiefly represented by the United States, would ultimately defeat the Soli Axis power in the region, Japan. The reasons for this are twofold. The first was one of simple geography. Germany was in no position to assist Japan militarily in any substantial sense, even if it had wanted to. Thus, a German victory in Europe was not necessarily a guarantor of Japan's ultimate security. The second, more important reason, was America's enormous advantages in productive capacity relative to that of Japan. Indeed, this basic fact was well understood by both parties, as an exchange immediately prior to the war between the American Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Harold R. Stark, and Japan's Special Ambassador to the United States, Admiral Nomura Kichisaburo, illustrates. With war clouds gathering, Stark remarked to Nomura, If you attack us, we will break your empire before we are through with you. While you may have initial success, the time will come when you too have your losses, but there will be this great difference. You will not only be unable to make up your losses, but will grow weaker as time goes on. While on the other hand, we will not only make up our losses, but will grow stronger as time goes on. It is inevitable that we shall crush you before we are through with you, Stark's comments precisely foretold the long-term strategic dynamics that would play out in the war that Japan would shortly initiate. Indeed, if anything, he understated the case, as Japan's ruinous, almost re-industrialised post-war economic situation vividly demonstrated. It is true that this inevitable victory might not have occurred if the American will to victory had flagged. In light of modern defeats in places like Vietnam, Beirut and Mogadishu, it is fashionable these days to question whether the American populace in World War II would have had the determination to see the war through to a successful finish in the face of something like a Japanese victory at Midway. However, this notion is unsupportable, being based on a post-war mindset that did not pertain during 1942. In the first place, drawing parallels between defeats in Lebanon, Somalia and Vietnam is not germane, these were all optional wars, for want of a better phrase. The American public knew that, win or lose, nothing that happened on those battlefields necessarily affected the global security of America or would have a dramatic impact on their way of life. The same most certainly cannot be said of World War II. Once France fell, Britain was attacked, and then the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor the American public somberly grasped the fundamental magnitude and importance of the struggle before them. The knowledge that this was total war, fought against evils of an appalling and absolute nature, pervaded the country. It steeled the collective resolve of the nation and prepared it for massive sacrifices of blood and treasure in ways that are lost on generations raised during and after Vietnam. World War II was fought by a generation that had grown up in full knowledge of the horrendous sacrifices that had been made in World War I. People of that era understood the level of effort that would be required. No one was under any illusions that they were in for anything other than a long, bitter and bloody war, and so indeed it proved. In the end, Midway stands as the most important battle of the Pacific War, not because it was decisive in an absolute sense, and not because it won the war in a day, but because of its immediate practical effects on American military options in the Pacific. In the succinct words of the Naval War College study of the battle, Midway put an end to Japanese offensive action and restored the balance of naval power in the Pacific. In this modern era of unchallenged American naval supremacy, merely restoring parity may not seem like much of an accomplishment,
but it must be recalled that Midway was fought between one navy at the peak of its strength and another if not at its nadir, then close to it. In the dark months of 1942, being able to claw back to parity was an enormous achievement. Thus, Midway clearly delineated where and when the strategic momentum in the Pacific War shifted over to the Americans. The Battle of Coral Sea had provided the first hints that the Japanese high water mark had been reached, but it was the Battle of Midway that put up the sign for all to see. Midway also marked the gateway to the attritional war that would be fought in the Solomons, a campaign that would irreparably ruin the Japanese Navy by destroying its elite naval aviation cadres and wrecking its surface forces beyond redemption. Midway didn't produce these consequences by itself, but it created the circumstances whereby the Japanese Navy would be fed into the shredder. As was stated in the introduction, all great battles inevitably create their own mythos. That is, every battle of note is comprised of a series of significant moments that provide a framework for understanding the outcome of the battle as a whole. They are the crucial, causative events that people look at and say, oh, so this is why things turned out as they did. Such a mythos clarifies and simplifies actions that are invariably messy, complex, and almost incomprehensibly violent. The present account, it is true, is a revisionist one, in that it disputes many of the beliefs regarding the Battle of Midway that have been in print for the last sixty years or so. It's appropriate, then, to end by briefly re-examining some of the conventional wisdom, and then attacking the last and greatest of the misconceptions that is still attached to this battle. The issues addressed so far include the following. At the time of the decisive American dive bomber attack at 10.20 a.m. to 10.25 a.m. on 4 June, the Japanese carriers were just minutes away from launching a decisive counterattack against the American carriers. This is categorically not true, and is one of the biggest fallacies in the conventional Japanese account. At the time of the decisive attack, the Japanese were at least a half hour away from being able to launch a strike, and few, if any. Japanese attack planes were on deck. The Aleutians' operation was an elaborate feint designed to lure the American fleet out of Pearl Harbor. Not true. The simultaneous launch of operations in the Aleutians was designed to capitalize on the Americans being busy elsewhere, so that objectives in the Aleutians could be seized without hindrance. Operation I was an invasion in its own right, strategically timed and not merely a diversion. During the transit to Midway, Admiral Yamamoto withheld important intelligence from Admiral Nagumo that might have changed the course of the battle. As a result, Nagumo was in the dark concerning the nature of the threat facing him at Midway. Not true. While Yamamoto did not communicate to Nagumo, there was no need to, as Kido Butai was perfectly capable of independently receiving timely intelligence from the first communications unit in Tokyo. Akagi-S intelligence estimate before the battle reveals that Nagumo had most of the important pieces of information already in hand. What is less clear is why he did not act on that intelligence had the Japanese implemented a two-phase search plan on the morning of 4 June. They would have succeeded in locating the American fleet in time to win the battle. Perhaps, but in 1942 the Japanese and Americans had yet to incorporate the notion of a two-phase search into their doctrine. Such a search plan was never an option, and it was disingenuous for Fuchida Mitsuo to imply that it was. The late launch of Cruiser Tone's scout plane doomed Admiral Nagumo's efforts to win the battle, not true. If anything, Tone No. 4's late launch and subsequent improvised search route led to the discovery of the Americans earlier than ought to have been expected. The true failures in scouting during the battle began with the failure of Japan's submarines to arrive on station on time, followed by the abandonment of Operation K, and culminated with Chikuma No. 1's failure to locate the Americans in the 6.15am time frame. Had Nagumo not decided to rearm his aircraft with land attack weapons, he would have been in a position to attack the Americans as soon as they were discovered. Not true. The reserve strike aircraft were not spotted on the flight deck when the Americans were detected. Given the time required to spot the decks, 
Nagumo's odds of launching an attack before Tomonaga's return were low at best. The ceaseless American air attacks had destroyed any reasonable possibility of spotting the decks before Tomonaga's return because of the constant launch and recovery of combat air patrol fighters. The sacrifice of Torpedo 8 was not in vain, since it pulled the Japanese combat air patrol fighters down to sea level, thereby allowing the American dive bombers to attack. Not true. Torpedo Squadron 8 demise happened a full hour before the decisive attack, giving plenty of time for the combat air patrol. Zeros to resume their correct stacking had they maintained discipline. Rather, Torpedo Squadron 8 contribution was the same as Torpedo Squadron 6's disrupting the counter-offensive activities of the Japanese carriers. The Japanese Naval Air Corps was all but wiped out at the Battle of Midway is not true, but Japanese casualties at Midway amounted to fewer than a quarter of the aviators embarked. Rather, it was the attritional campaign in the Solomons that destroyed the elite corps of Japanese naval aviators. However, the most pernicious myth concerning the Battle of Midway has never been seriously questioned, even though evidence to the contrary was readily available. The continuance of this myth suggests that it fits conveniently into the glorification of this possibly the greatest United States naval victory of all time. Appealing as the myth is to any historian who becomes involved in studying Midway, its attractiveness must not outweigh a careful cross-checking of sources and a dispassionate evaluation of the factual evidence. The myth in question is the persistent belief that in defeating the Japanese, the Americans miraculously triumphed against overwhelming odds. With no disrespect intended toward the late Walter Lord, who generously assisted the authors in the creation of this work. The foreword to his otherwise very laudable incredible victory nevertheless encapsulates this belief as eloquently as anything else in print. By any ordinary standard, they were hopelessly outclassed. They had no battleships, the enemy eleven, they had eight cruisers, the enemy twenty-three, they had three carriers, one of them crippled, the enemy had eight. They had no right to win, yet they did, and in doing so they changed the course of a war. More than that, they added a new name midway to that small list that inspires men by shining example. Like Marathon, the Armada, the Marne, a few others, midway showed that every once in a while what must be need not be at all. Even against the greatest of odds, there is something in the human spirit, a magic blend of skill, faith and valour, that can lift men from certain defeat to incredible victory. Lord certainly didn't invent this notion, but he articulated a general post-war attitude that has been echoed endlessly in almost every American text on the battle until it has been accepted as holy writ. It is a conviction that has been subtly reinforced by the very titles of the two most important English-language histories of the battle Miracle at Midway. Additionally, Incredible victory and less subtly amplified by numerous television documentaries, by every talk given at a World War II veterans group, and by hundreds of internet discussions that have self-referentially reinforced the notion. It has gotten so out of hand, in fact, that historian John Lundstrom has jokingly coined a phrase to describe it, incredible victory disease. However, the notion that Midway was somehow a miraculous triumph fought in the face of crushing Japanese superiority, is a fallacy, and one greatly in need of dispelling. Furthermore, it is a fallacy that can be easily refuted at two different levels of analysis first, by examining the opposing forces and their operational plans during the battle, and second, by analysing the command decisions of the two opposing supreme commanders, Yamamoto Isoroku and Chester Nimitz. First, the numbers. It is quite true that in May of 1942, the combined fleet enjoyed an aggregate numerical advantage over the United States Navy in the Pacific, and conceivably could have brought overwhelming firepower to bear anywhere in that theatre of operations. It is further true that the bulk of combined fleet was indeed operating in support of Operations I and MI on the morning of 4 June. But the Japanese battle plan ensured that the majority of this force could not have engaged any American units on that day. Claiming that the American defenders at Midway somehow fought against this impressive array of warships in toto 
when the majority of the Japanese vessels participating never fired a shot in anger, never once raised their speed of advance or retreat in reaction to an impending American attack, were never even sighted by so much as an American scout plane is to overstate the matter egregiously. The forces that deserved to be tallied were those present at the point of tactical contact on the morning of 4 June, and that were within a day's steaming distance of the island of Midway itself. By those qualifications, Nihon Kaigun had exactly two formations worth considering Nagumo's first mobile striking force and Tanaka's invasion force. The latter can be disregarded, as, by definition, it was incapable of offensive action. For his part, Nagumo brought 20 warships to face the United States Navy's 25. He was operating a grand total of four aircraft carriers and 248 carrier aircraft. The Americans, between their three carriers, none of which can be honestly described as crippled, mounted a total of 233 carrier aircraft and could call upon another 120-odd aircraft from Midway. Like the Japanese, the Americans had four airstrips from which to operate, with the added benefit that one of theirs could not be sunk. In other words, where it really counted, it was the Japanese who were outnumbered in terms of both warships and aircraft, not the other way around. Some may protest that Yamamoto's main body should be included in this equation, as well as Kurita and Kondo's support forces, since they were also driving on Midway. However, advocates of this line of reasoning ignore the obvious fact that as far as Nagumo and the outcome of the battle was concerned, those forces might as well have been on the moon. The outcome at Midway was determined in the space of about six hours, between 4.30am and 10.30am. By the end of that period, the battle was fundamentally decided in favour of the Americans. The only thing left to be seen was whether Hiryu would exact some measure of retribution before she, too, was finally caught and smashed. Nothing that Yamamoto's main body or the other support formations could do was going to reverse that decision, because in truth, they were in no position to support anything. Thus, the only forces that are relevant in a discussion of who outnumbered who were the ones in a position to have exchanged actual blows on 4 June meaning Nagumo's and Fletcher's, period. It is quite true that in comparison with Fletcher's command, Nagumo could muster superior gunpower in the form of his two fast battleships, not to mention the combat capability provided by the torpedoes of his destroyers and cruisers, if it ever came to that. But of course, it never really could have come to that, and neither of these measuring sticks was at all relevant to the outcome of the battle. Admirals Fletcher and Spruance had no interest in becoming embroiled in a surface fight and manoeuvred their forces carefully so as to avoid any chance of such entanglements. Thus, Nagumo could never salvage victory from defeat by using his superiorities in, say, night fighting. A surface battle could only build on the success that his aircraft brought him, it could never replace them. It was aircraft and flight decks that were the true index of victory or defeat, and it is clear that the Japanese enjoyed no numerical advantage in this respect. To be sure, it is also true that in several key qualitative areas, such as aircraft performance, at least in terms of fighters and torpedo aircraft, pilot experience, and the ability to mass the offensive firepower of their carrier air groups, Nagumo possessed distinct advantages. Their importance should not be discounted, as shown by the effectiveness of Hiryu's strikes against Yorktown, with a relatively small number of planes and with no advantage of surprise. Thus, a real understanding of the battle requires weighing the strengths and weaknesses of both forces, and, hopefully, this study has indicated the intricate matrix of qualitative factors, doctrinal subtleties, planning shortcomings, and sheer good and bad fortune that played into the final outcome of the battle. Too often, however, the casual reader of popular history prefers to ignore such subtleties and to focus instead on simplistic numbers and catchphrases like overwhelming odds. They paint for themselves a mental picture of veritable hordes of Japanese being fended off by a ragtag but plucky band of hideously outnumbered Americans. While serious studies of the battle have provided a more nuanced picture, they have not been as direct as they might in disparaging this chauvinistic, overly simplified view.
The myth of supposedly overwhelming Japanese force runs into further problems because it contradicts other popularly held notions about Midway, such as the perceived incompetence of Admiral Yamamoto. Some Western observers have argued for Japan's stunning numerical advantages, while simultaneously attacking Yamamoto's unwise dispersal of his assets. Yet, if Nagumo's defeat was truly as miraculous as these same writers would have us believe, then Yamamoto can hardly be faulted for dispersing his forces after first equipping his subordinate Nagumo with such a wealth of military force that, apparently, only an act of God was sufficient to defeat it. The inconsistency is obvious. Either Yamamoto did not provide sufficient forces to Nagumo, and the odds were thereby considerably less in Japan's favour than the popular wisdom would have us believe, or Yamamoto's battle plan wasn't as deeply flawed as it has been made out to be. Both positions cannot be true. The view argued here has been that Yamamoto's battle plan was indeed badly flowered, in that it assumed that the Americans were mentally beaten, and that stealth and deception were therefore to be prized above sufficiency of force at the point of contact. In hindsight, Nagumo's force was clearly inadequate for the task at hand. It should never have left port without one, and preferably both, of Carrier Division 5's carriers. To do otherwise was to cut the margin of sufficiency too fine, as was disastrously demonstrated. Indeed, the real miracle of Midway from the American point of view may well have been Yamamoto's failure to provide Nagumo with sufficient forces to guarantee victory in battle, given that he might readily have done so. Even greater problems occur when those who hew to the myth evaluate the performance of Admiral Chester Nimitz. If one believes in the notion of overwhelming Japanese superiority, then Nimitz's decision to engage the enemy and accept the horrific odds against him must be judged reckless in the extreme. Nothing less can explain his willingness to walk clear-eyed into a fight. The only thing left to be seen was whether Hiryu would exact some measure of retribution before she too was finally caught and smashed. Nothing that Yamamoto's main body or the other support formations could do was going to reverse that decision, because in truth they were in no position to support anything. Thus, the only forces that are relevant in a discussion of who outnumbered who were the ones in a position to have exchanged actual blows on 4 June, meaning Nagumo's and Fletcher's, period. It is quite true that in comparison with Fletcher's command, Nagumo could muster superior gunpower in the form of his two fast battleships, not to mention the combat capability provided by the torpedoes of his destroyers and cruisers, if it ever came to that. But of course, it never really could have come to that, and neither of these measuring sticks was at all relevant to the outcome of the battle. Admirals Fletcher and Spruance had no interest in becoming embroiled in a surface fight and manoeuvred their forces carefully so as to avoid any chance of such entanglements. Thus, Nagumo could never salvage victory from defeat by using his superiorities in, say, night fighting. A surface battle could only build on the success that his aircraft brought him, it could never replace them. It was aircraft and flight decks that were the true index of victory or defeat, and it is clear that the Japanese enjoyed no numerical advantage in this respect. To be sure, it is also true that in several key qualitative areas such as aircraft performance, at least in terms of fighters and torpedo aircraft, pilot experience, and the ability to mass the offensive firepower of their carrier air groups. Nagumo possessed distinct advantages. Their importance should not be discounted, as shown by the effectiveness of Hiryu's strikes against Yorktown, with a relatively small number of planes and with no advantage of surprise. Thus, a real understanding of the battle requires weighing the strengths and weaknesses of both forces, and, hopefully, this study has indicated the intricate matrix of qualitative factors, doctrinal subtleties, planning shortcomings, and sheer good and bad fortune that played into the final outcome of the battle. Too often, however, the casual reader of popular history prefers to ignore such subtleties and to focus instead on simplistic numbers and catchphrases like overwhelming odds. They paint for themselves a mental picture of veritable hordes of Japanese being fended off by a ragtag but plucky band of hideously outnumbered Americans. While serious studies of the battle have provided a more nuanced picture, 
they have not been as direct as they might in disparaging this chauvinistic, overly simplified view. The myth of supposedly overwhelming Japanese force runs into further problems because it contradicts other popularly held notions about Midway, such as the perceived incompetence of Admiral Yamamoto. Some Western observers have argued for Japan's stunning numerical advantages while simultaneously attacking Yamamoto's unwise dispersal of his assets. Yet, if Nagumo's defeat was truly as miraculous as these same writers would have us believe, then Yamamoto can hardly be faulted for dispersing his forces after first equipping his subordinate Nagumo with such a wealth of military force that, apparently, only an act of God was sufficient to defeat it. The inconsistency is obvious. Either Yamamoto did not provide sufficient forces to Nagumo, and the odds were thereby considerably less in Japan's favour than the popular wisdom would have us believe, or Yamamoto's battle plan wasn't as deeply flawed as it has been made out to be. Both positions cannot be true. The view argued here has been that Yamamoto's battle plan was indeed badly flowered, in that it assumed that the Americans were mentally beaten, and that stealth and deception were therefore to be prized above sufficiency of force at the point of contact. In hindsight, Nagumo's force was clearly inadequate for the task at hand. It should never have left port without one, and preferably both, of Carrier Division 5's carriers. To do otherwise was to cut the margin of sufficiency too fine, as was disastrously demonstrated. Indeed, the real miracle of Midway from the American point of view may well have been Yamamoto's failure to provide Nagumo with sufficient forces to guarantee victory in battle, given that he might readily have done so. Even greater problems occur when those who hew to the myth evaluate the performance of Admiral Chester Nimitz. If one believes in the notion of overwhelming Japanese superiority, then Nimitz's decision to engage the enemy and accept the horrific odds against him must be judged reckless in the extreme.